Security Officer for Amazon Web Services Security. He is responsible for engaging customers, partners, and internal AWS teams to advance cloud adoption, cloud security and identity, and the mission of Amazon Web Services. He has been in various positions at Amazon Web Services for eight years and is an expert in cloud deployments, including public and hybrid cloud infrastructure. Before AWS, he was a systems architect for various government contractors. Mr. Diemen, Van Diemen is a technologist through and through. He loves to dive into complex technical situations that turn into great solutions. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Quint Van Diemen. And uh, Quint, uh, just finishing up a conversation we uh, had a, a short time ago, we'll run to about 145 and we'll take about five minutes of questions. Sounds great, uh, looking forward to it. Uh, Good morning, good afternoon. I guess it's good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the uh, four men or the uh, the always uh, fun after lunch spot. Um, but I'm super excited to be here with you all today, and I promise to actually have lots of fun pictures that'll hopefully keep us uh, good and motivated and engaged. Um, I'm also to recount uh, sort of um, you know that that great introduction, um, but I'm hoping that I can give you sort of a different perspective on zero trust today. Uh, you know, as we've seen executive orders and lots of the different guidance come out from uh, various parts of the of the government, you know, everybody's really focused on sort of the what of Zero Trust. Uh, I want to take you a, uh, a little bit today on a different journey, sort of a, a retrospective, if you will, um, on, you know, so how Amazon has, uh, uh, you know, been on this journey to Zero Trust in our, within our own business uh, in a way that we'll talk a little bit about sort of the what we built and how we did it, but uh, really more going to focus on sort of the, you know, those insights, uh, those sort of lessons learned, uh, hopefully in ways that you'll be able to apply them uh, to your own sort of journey to uh, zero trust, right? And, you know, as I sort of mentioned there, this is a journey that we started back in 2010, uh, long before zero trust was a, sort of a fashionable term. It was just sort of good security for us. Next slide, please. So, you know, we're going to, here's sort of a little bit of the of the roadmap for today, sort of what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to start giving a little bit of an overview of some of the formative experiences that, you know, we sort of had sort of the prequel uh, to Zero Trust, the lessons we learned that I think really accelerated the journey. And then we'll take uh, a whirlwind tour across, you know, probably the four key implementations that we've been after, right? Uh, everything from Amazon.com to Amazon as a business to our cloud business uh, and a few things in between. So let's get going. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, and next slide, please. Um, so, you know, I guess um, before we even get to zero trust, uh, we really learned uh, a fundamental and formative lesson early on. Um, you know, we had this system that helped us manage a quarterly baselining uh, process, right? This, this who has access to what. I suspect you, you all have probably participated or, or run those before. And the original system was just clunky and slow and, and not terribly user friendly. And, uh, you know, it led to complacency on the behalf of the humans that were using the system. And so somewhere along the line, you know, we made some tweaks, right? We cleaned up the interface. We made the system more responsive. Uh, we made the human job, uh, the humans reviewer's job easier by giving them, you know, easy buttons that were intuitive that uh, sort of quickly let them work through the workflow. And the results were really dramatic, right? Uh, something on the order of 70 to 80% of the permissions that the system was responsible for managing were pruned in the next cycle just after those improvements. And that was essentially more than had been pruned in the entire previous existence of the tool. And, you know, we walked away with that with a really key lesson uh, that, that security is, a, uh, you know, it's probably, it's, uh, it's unfashionable in security realms to describe it as a, a social engineering problem because that carries a lot of connotation. That's sort of my asterisk there, but maybe better put that security is a human problem and that user experience really is everything. Next slide, please. Sort of interlaced with that, uh, you know, that same system really helped us understand that uh, these notions of ownership and access control are really, really symbiotic. Uh, you can't sort of do one without the other, uh, much less sort of work towards these privilege. Um, now, you know, it's, it stands to, it's fairly obvious that you have to have, you know, good and accurate ownership information to be able to figure out who should be approving access requests, right? But 
The inverse is also equally true, right? And that's maybe the lesson we're trying to convey here is that you can use access requests to force good ownership data. Uh, you know, if ownership you know, requests are being processed properly, you forward them up the tree, you escalate them until you eventually find somebody within the or owner or the organization that uh, does own that even at a high level and can sort of properly delegate it back down, right? And, you know, we use these sort of symbiotic relationships a lot within Amazon, but we really found this one to be particularly powerful. And, you know, the so what here is that, you know, much of what you end up trying to get to around zero trust, uh, really is deeply rooted in ownership. And, you know, without that, it's sort of garbage in, garbage out. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so now let's, uh, with those sort of prequels out of the way, uh, let's talk about some, some zero trust implementations across Amazon. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is uh, what was at the time known as Amazon AAA, authentication, authorization, and accounting. Um, next slide, please. So this is probably how you foresee uh, Amazon.com, right? Paper towels and anything else that you want to your door in two days or less. Next slide, please. Uh, but this is this is how we see Amazon.com. Uh, this slide is or this picture is actually representative of what Amazon.com looked like in 2009. Uh, but even then, back then, it was you know tens of thousands of microservices that that worked together. Uh, often in very lengthy call chains to produce that unified customer experience. Um, you know, if you looked at the call graph today, it would be, it almost looks like a picture of a, of a universe somewhere. It's, uh, you know, all the points are so small and, and distant. So, uh, but the, the, po the point being not the specifics, but, you know, that it is truly this, this web of systems. Next slide, please. So now, you know, again, way back in the day, we're talking, you know, uh, you know, in the in the pre-2010 era, um, you know, the, this we had sort of gone through this uh, evolution to microservices, uh, but our security model still probably wasn't that great. Right. It was very it was very, you know, I'd say on par for the time, uh, but it was it was one that was rooted, uh, rooted in, uh, you know, sort of exactly what Zero Trust tries to espouse. Uh, against these days it was very network perimeter centric. Uh, we had a whole bunch of these microservices on the inside uh, that was deemed to be good. We had everything else on the outside that was all deemed to be bad. And then, you know, the microservices could simply call one another over RPC uh, if they if they essentially knew the, the IPv4 network address of the corresponding service. So, uh, you know, that's that, that, you know, again, is a really sort of soft center model. Um, and there wasn't really much that would stop some, you know, either a, a misbehaving service or a misbehaving operator from doing something, uh, you know, somewhat nefarious within that good zone. So we, we clearly knew we needed to do better. Next slide, please. So this slide, uh, you know, forgive me, uh, usually I, I use uh, some sort of automations to make this a little bit more clear as it builds out, uh, but we've had to sort of flatten those out to, uh, to work within the, the confines here. Uh, but this is sort of what you know, better looks like is, is we really brought those, those zero trust principles to these, these components that back Amazon.com. Uh, the services that to start, the services themselves were split up into individual resource containers that were sort of, that naturally isolated both the components of the given service and the operators of that service. Um, we then had a, uh, you know, sort of service registration portal that let these service owners go uh, you know, register their own service, make access requests to be able to call other services. Um, and, you know, that lesson number zero was sort of firmly in mind. Uh, you know, we were able to, because we had good ownership data, we were able to pre-populate most of what they were looking for. Nobody had to go looking up what the email address was for the owner of, you know, service number two. Uh, so it let us pre-populate a bunch of things, keep the workflow simple, and focused on it, uh, on it being a really valuable tool for the service owner and not sort of outwardly a security solution. Um, so then when, you know, service, uh, the, the sort of the recipient of the access request, you know, received that email, again, sort of managed by a nice workflow, um, you know, and they looked at who was asking to connect and why, and they hit the button uh, to say, I approve this connection. Uh, the system orchestrated a couple of things on their behalf, right? Uh, one is it used APIs to create this, this very private software-defined uh, networking link. It's sort of in, illustrated there in pink. 
in a way that, you know, if service one and service two didn't have any need to talk to one another, they physically couldn't. There actually just wasn't a path. And this thing created those paths on demand. Uh, second, it provisions and delivered a bunch of or provisions and delivered security credentials for service one to be able to, to authenticate into service two. Right. And, you know, that sounds like a trivial thing, but really done at scale, uh, those sorts of credential management or secrets management uh, challenges can be uh, really burdensome. And we didn't want these service owners to, to sort of think about it. Uh, third is it created an authorization policy that, you know, really, you know, uh, sort of got in the middle of these connections and really mediated who could actually, you know, sort of call uh, one another. Uh, and particularly sort of not just can service one call service two, but can they do it on behalf of this given user under this given context, right? And then fourth is, is it deployed, uh, and we can sort of, we'll talk about this in a bit, why this is important, is it deployed some local infrastructure into those uh, distributed sort of private enclaves uh, that, that, that facilitated the evaluation of these decisions in a very locally centric way, right? And so, you know, at that point, each, you know, each of these services had, you know, sort of these, um, you know, a, a very simple way to sort of turn this on. It had, you know, these service owners had a portal where they could, you know, view, um, you know, these, these connections and, and make these, uh, uh, these requests. But moreover, you know, the same portal also gave them a really uh, a lot of great operational data, right? They, for the first time, understood, well, what other services are calling me? Um, you know, wh why are they calling me? And, and it was really, um, you know, that was, that was what uh, this, these service owners really derived as the value, was these great new, uh, you know, operational insights about their service. Sort of the security was, was coming along for the ride. Okay, so let's let's move on and talk about what we learned. Next slide, please. And you know, I, I sort of already maybe uh, touched on this a bit, but you know, this this was the, this was the real sort of key lesson from the system is that uh, while security is usually the outcome we're talking about with zero trust, you know, it's it's you know the key customer in this equation, uh, particularly as it applied here to Amazon.com. Were those service owners, uh, not the security department, right? Uh, security sort of came along for the ride uh, under the, the banner of giving folks good operational tool, right? That sort of the catchphrase was security was the medicine wrapped in operational excellence candy. Uh, and, it, and it really, we use that to really uh, build onboarding, um, you know, and, and roll things out without them being super painful. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, the second sort of lesson learned here is that, you know, the system really was purpose, uh, you know, it, it's whenever you're, whenever a team that maybe doesn't focus on security is trying to, you know, uh, implement stronger security, they're always worried about breaking things, right? And what the system, I think, really did a great job of was giving folks guardrails and insights to allow them to turn on the security uh, confidently and know that they wouldn't break stuff. Right. And so in this particular case, the system, this AAA system, had both audit and enforce modes, right, is something that's fairly common in security systems. Allow them to do is, you know, they, you've got this, again, big mesh of, of services have onboarded, some haven't, and you need to give people a way to sort of slowly onboard all of their dependent services and not sort of be able to flip or not, you know, or, or, and give them confidence that everybody that depends on them has sort of similarly onboarded before they flip that magic switch into an, an, into enforcement mode, right? And, you know, the details sort of don't matter here, but that was really... Uh, a very powerful part of the system was giving those service owners an understanding between and sort of get them on board with the system. Right? So again, sort of gave them real confidence that when they flipped that switch, they knew that they weren't going to be breaking stuff. Next slide, please. Uh, the third lesson sort of here, uh, and you know, I, I tried to maybe foreshadow it a little bit, is that you know, as security, latency, and availability become really tightly entangled, the trade-offs aren't trivial, right? Um, you know, I feel like particularly in the, the realm of zero trust, you'll see tons of architectures where there's a big choke point in the center of it. Um, and that works great as a logical design, uh, but certainly, you know, if you're operating at Amazon scale, it's not an effective physical one, right? And if you aren't careful, 
those things making those very powerful access decisions will essentially buckle under the load. And then you've, you've, you've chained in everything in a way uh, that you've got these critical dependencies that may not be able to handle the load. And so uh, at Amazon, we've had to invent a good number of architectures that allow us to sort of have our cake and eat it too, uh, allow us to make good, um, you know, sort of uh, security decisions while keeping those other concerns of latency and availability in harmony. Um, you know, one of the ones that we talk about a lot is what's known as static stability, um, sort of well outside our, our discussion for today. But, you know, if you want to go uh, read and learn about some of those patterns that we built for our business, uh, is what's known as the Amazon Builders Library that's, that's public and out there on the internet. Next slide, please. Okay, so now let's, uh, you know, uh, end Act 1. Let's uh, sort of quickly move into Act number 2, uh, which is a system that we call Amazon Enterprise Access. And this is you know, how Amazon has enabled zero trust for, uh, I, I, well, I think we can conservatively say, over a million uh, employees and endpoint devices around the world. This is the sort of the classic beyond corp use case. Next slide, please. And so, you know, again, uh, these slides, uh, maybe the lack of animations makes them a little bit less interesting. Uh, but once upon a time, uh, you know, we had a whole bunch of users and they needed to connect to a whole bunch of apps. And they did that just the same way that everybody did it back then, right? With a good old fashioned uh, VPN. Next slide, please. Um, but sort of two things then happened, uh, you know, maybe not perfectly simultaneously, but, but reasonably at once. Um, and the first was that, you know, we, while these internal applications that everybody was connecting to, I think we're, we're generally very good at uh, sort of maintaining good security standards and practices. Uh, we wanted them to do it even better, right? And the sort of the, the the standard that, you know, would be articulated internally was that we wanted these systems to be protected just the way that we would as, if they existed on the, the public internet, right? And, you know, that that's just a super straightforward way of describing like a very hostile environment in which these apps have to operate uh, and, and gives sort of you know, a very clear understanding that uh, there's there's no sort of, um, you, you can't make any compromises on this, right? It's a very, just sort of clear line that, that is easy for folks to understand. Next slide, please. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, our workforce was changing. Uh, we had some portion of those aforementioned, you know, million uh, employees or workforce users that were very comfortable, like the VPN just sort of worked for them. They had a laptop, they could go to the coffee shop, yeah, sure. Maybe it, we'll, we'll talk about it. it. Was a little bit painful to to you know, have to double authenticate, but all in all, it wasn't that terrible. Um, but you know, we had you know very real. Um, you know, we had our workforce was sort of changing in a couple of different ways, right? Uh, one is we all of a sudden found ourselves with increasing numbers of workforce users that, that either operated mostly or completely outside of corporate locations, right? You've probably seen. Uh, Amazon Prime delivery trucks around your neighborhood. Uh, and we also had, you know, just, it, you know, while they did, it, they sort of fit in that first bucket, those corporate users with laptops, we had just increasingly numbers of uh, on-call engineers that, you know, might be out at a son or daughter's, uh, you know, soccer game or swim meet. And, you know, if they were on call, we didn't want them to have to be lugging around that laptop and, you know, or dashing away back to the car uh, just because they got a page or they got an alert. Next, next slide, please. And so oh, we definitely uh, you know, missed a little flattening of the animation here. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, I'm not sure if we can sort of click through it. I'm not sure uh, you know, what got kind of mashed here, but uh, the, the, we'll, we'll forego the, the graphic. Uh, but what was born was essentially this system known as Amazon Enterprise Access, right? The sort of guts of it are uh, you know, a, a custom OpenID Connect identity provider, uh, that's got, you know, really strong integration with hardware-backed security keys for really strong uh, user identity. Uh, it's got a custom device agent on all of, you know, those laptops. Uh, it's got mobile apps for iOS and Android, um, you know, that gives us posture assessment. And, and sort of all of those systems give us posture assessment during authentication. And then it was, again, sort of back to that the service owner is equally the customer, had this notion of one-click uh, one click enablement, right? Where, you know, an application owner could go in with confidence, uh, you know, into a portal, you know, uh, say that I want my application protected by AEA and the system sort of took care of the rest. And, 
you know, they, they, that, that empowered sort of two things. One is they knew that system they were going behind uh, had been engineered by real experts. And two is, uh, you know, they were very purposeful about uh, sort of the onboarding experiences. And, and 99% of those applications actually onboarded with zero downtime uh, whatsoever. So, all right, let's move on, uh, especially given the uh, sort of the chaos of, uh, of that slide, please. Um, so, you know, again, what, what are some of the takeaways that we have here, right? Uh, so similar to, to sort of AAA, you know, in this case, zero trust, and I, you know, I really, I really try to harp on this a lot when I talk with folks about zero trust. Zero trust is the how; it wasn't the what. Um, you know, we weren't, we didn't build AEA strictly for security's sake. Uh, we we built AEA so our employees could be more flexible and happy in the, in their work, uh, right? And that the security again sort of came along for the ride. Uh, but I think that's a super important uh, point to just be focused on, you know, the real business outcome we're, we're after with zero trust and not get fascinated with zero trust for zero trust sake. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, you know, this, the, the, the next, uh, you know, lesson here, right, is, and, and I've sort of touched on this, this tension before, this, this notion of, you know, really being deliberate about the service owners being uh, the customers as well is another thing that this tool really did is it avoided, you know, the, the proverbial sort of trade-off that, that, you know, our application teams are so often, you know, forced to make, right? In this case, uh, instead, of, instead of going out and running this big campaign and saying, you service teams need to go do all these things to make your apps uh, ready to be on the internet and defer all this great functionality that you want to give to your users, uh, the centralization of that central service, uh, coupled with sort of that great onboarding experience, made it so they didn't have to sort of take that trade off, right? They, they, you know, whether it was making the, the, the flipping the switch super simple, which I, I sort of already described, or, you know, sort of having these, you know, managed protections, um, you know, it made it so that they could onboard confidently and safely without, you know, sort of taking the time or making these unnecessary trade offs. Uh, there were also sort of extra carrots along the way, right? So I mentioned a mobile app. And so this was, a, you know, sort of a, a for free carrot that we could offer to these service owners that, you know, if they onboarded to the system, they were going to be able to get mobile access uh, from the workforce to their applications sort of for free. And, you know, all of those things, again, uh, so now we're not only not making them uh, choose a trade off between security and features, we're actually bringing them features that they didn't even or that they didn't even have sort of in their minds. Next slide, please. Cool. So, uh, you know, I think I, I'll, I'll go through this one quickly because I've already mentioned this, you know, a handful of times, right? But, you know, again, um, getting the end users, you know, sort of giving them an appetite for this stuff is really a key and powerful driver of adoption. Uh, AWS security, Amazon security didn't need to go around to all of these service teams and say, thou shall do this thing. Uh, like is so often the case, because we had that workforce that started getting a taste of it and they started to expect it and they started to lobby the various, you know, tens of thousands of application owners, you know, on, on, you know, security's behalf, right? It, it became this expectation. It became, you know, sort of a shameful thing for your application if it required you uh, to get on the VPN. Uh, now, the VPN is still there. It probably maybe always will be for, for certain things. Uh, but it was a really, really powerful, uh, just having the end users be the advocate of the system was a really powerful driver of adoption. Uh, next slide, please. Cool. So I, I'm really going to, I really want to leave some time uh, for some Q&A at the end. So, uh, you know, we'll go through Unfabric pretty quickly. This was essentially removing our corporate networks from Amazon offices. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is where we started, right? Uh, it, it's important to note that the sort of the corporate networks, very distinct from our production networks, but we largely had, you know, you know, these corporate networks were sort of deployed everywhere. Next slide, please. And they made sort of no distinction between uh, a lot of things. And, uh, you know, what that, you know, sort of what that, you know, the lesson here, and maybe this one's a little bit of a dumb moment, but, you know, once your users can essentially access everything they need, over the internet, the, you know, the AEA system that we looked at before, uh, that's all they need, regardless of, of where, you know, where they are. So next slide, please. 
And so that's what we did, and it looks like the, uh, the animation has maybe failed, or the flattening of the animations has maybe failed us uh, on this slide again. Uh, but what we essentially did is we shrunk the corporate networks uh, out of those office buildings and purely into the places where uh, applications were hosted in a way that just had a tremendous reduction of the surface area uh, of, you know, our, our IT estate, right? And, um, you know, so in the interest of time, let's, let's move on, please. Um, yeah, the, the lesson here was that, um, you know, beyond just sort of the security one, it also just had this, you know, by decoupling the deployment of these, you know, big, you know, thorny corporate networks to these sites, it really let us, you know, flex and grow our business uh, much, much faster. We, we needed to expand to a gif different geography. Awesome. Next slide, please. Uh, so finally, we're going to look at, uh, at, you know, so cloud services, right? And these are a little bit different because... Uh, cloud services have sort of were sort of born day day one with uh, with zero trust in mind. Next slide, please. Um, but you know, uh, if you're not familiar with AWS, it's not terribly important, right? But you see lots of great um, you know sort of zero trust principles at work here. Uh, you know, each and every day, you know, our millions of customers call AWS. Uh, you know, over the strength of uh, TLS over the internet, using uh, you know the strong cryptography cryptography provided by that you know, network path uh, enhanced by, you know, what we have as or what we call our SIG v4 signing protocol. And, and the, the details aren't terribly important. The text not terribly important. Uh, but essentially, we're authenticating and authorizing, you know, these requests to the tune of 500 million requests per second, which is pretty crazy, um, you know, each and every day. Uh, and, and, and it's really sort of a great embodiment of these zero trust principles, right? Uh, authenticating each request. Um, Cool. So let's uh, let's move on. Next slide, please. Um, you know, again, uh, AWS services sort of, you know, the root, you know, the, 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 the slide, the, the details here aren't super important to you. Uh, but the takeaway that I want to give you here is that AWS services, right, there's 300 or so of these services today. Uh, they don't take any liberty in assuming that just because one, you know, two different things are both within the umbrella of AWS, that there should be any inherent trust there, right? They actually use the same identity centric mechanisms that our customers use to do strong request level authentication authorization uh, each and every time they need to interact with one another. And, and so it's the same model that our customers use. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, just super quickly to wrap it up, right? Uh, lesson number nine, you know, a bunch of folks will in this circle will, will rant and rave about, you know, uh, the network perimeter is dead, long live the network perimeter. Uh, our customers have very clearly and loudly told us that, you know, they want both and they want them to work together well. And so I think that it's important to sort of avoid that, uh, those sort of academic debates uh, around, you know, network perimeters and identity centric. Let's, let's get them to work better together. And then uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, um, you know, sort of, again, maybe this one is uh, somewhat in the realm of obvious, uh, but it certainly with the cloud taught us that, you know, to really, it's easy to build zero trust in sort of a proof of concept. Uh, but if you want to do it at scale, these things really need to be, these primitives that we build zero trust upon really need to be programmable. They need to be software defined because uh, at those levels of granularity and these gran levels of scale, uh, it's simply not going to be a human oriented job. And so uh, with that, uh, if there's time for at least hopefully one or two questions, uh, that's what I had. Thanks for having me.